the stimulus paper, the stimulus report we've just written, I've just written with my colleague Veronica Strang, Professor Strang, is leading interdisciplinary research transforming the academic landscape. So summary, interdisciplinary research, it's a buzzword, people talk about it, but do they really do it? Um, and what we wanted to do, Veronica Strang and myself, was to discuss the philosophical academic foundations of crossing the silos, uh, where the motivation for exploring these transdisciplinary spaces comes from, um, all the way through to hard-nosed practical advice, how one should structure and govern research centres, institutes, in a world where, for example, the REF um, asks us to report our academic results and outputs on very much single disciplinary lines. So there are practical tensions as well as fundamental thinking to do. Academically, we see a danger that our universities, our campuses, our subject palettes become increasingly fragmented. This is, happens from school, it happens in the media as well. Um, and in academia, we're not so good at providing perhaps the disciplinary coherent glue that we should. It's important for, for, uh, for cultural reasons, therefore, but it's also important for very practical reasons. Um, many of the serious challenges, global challenges we face today, healthcare, next generation medicine, population, climate change, uh, urbanization, new cities, um, uh, all of those challenges, problems, none of them has a solution that can be spoken from a single disciplinary background. All of them call on an interdisciplinary approach. But getting that right isn't easy, so that's why it's important. So what are the key themes of the report? So we start off talking at really a fundamental a philosophical level um, about a culture change. Um, we uh, often experience the way that interdisciplinary research is framed, the way it's talked about and managed, um, is as it were a nice to have, an icing on the cake, a superstructure to the disciplinary academic foundations. But actually the more that we've thought about this, the more we've become convinced that the interdisciplinary <coughs> world is at the academic's core, it's at the university's heart. So we want to invert the superstructure model and talk about how we embed interdisciplinary approaches into the heart of university thinking and structure. So that's the first part of the uh, paper. Um, we then go on to look at leadership and models of leadership. We have some case studies of examples where we think interdisciplinary research has worked well. We look at the pitfalls, we look at the temptations of superficially appropriate interdisciplinary research, but that really uh, doesn't mix the colours, it doesn't bake the cake. Um, it just mixes some ingredients and nothing really happens. We look about how to avoid that. And then we finish with some very practical, drawing on practical experience and advice on how universities can support uh, research of this kind, support uh, interdisciplinary thinking, um, support good practice in training, in finance, in structures. Um, we look at uh, uh, interdisciplinary institutes and centres um, and then we finish with uh, a look to the challenges in the future. So the three case studies in the report, uh, we chose them to represent a widespread of topic um, and of motivation. Uh, and uh, a widespread of interdisciplinary mix. So one um, starts and finishes within the sciences. From outside the scientific disciplines, um, it sometimes, uh, a, sometimes seems to be the case that there's no such great challenge of doing IDR, interdisciplinary research. Um, but actually, for chemists to talk with computer scientists and physicists, for biologists to talk with mathematicians is not so very easy. There's a lot of disciplinary language, values, um, communities to uh, understand there. So we have a case study called Microscale Polymer Processing. It's an example um, that took place in the UK between about six universities to start with. 
eight by the time it finished, and the same number of global companies, really in the plastics industry. Uh, it's about a, an academic and intellectual and industrial revolution um, of designing new polymeric materials from the molecular recipes up rather from the materials properties down. It's replacing empiricism by application of molecular physics. And it took very serious integration of an industrial community outside academia, which is another important ingredient we wanted to discuss in the paper as a whole, with an academic team inside. If you like, there's a sort of matching of the natural interdisciplinary uh, communities that solve industrial problems with ways that one can build in universities um, communities that are, are matched to them. So we had chemists, physicists, computer scientists working together. The outputs were, were software, which now after a run of about 10 years is now used routinely to design new polymers. So that was the, uh, that's the first uh, example. Um, we discussed the way that when user communities of an interdisciplinary nature and academics doing interdisciplinary research effectively interact, there is as much intellectual flow one way as the other. The often stated linear model of intellectual property generated in universities being spun out to business communities in really healthy research projects um, is, it works, doesn't work like that. It works in a much more interested, um, non-linear, loopy way. A second project is called the Ordered Universe Project. This is a humanities science collaboration. It's a team uh, started in Durham but now has scholars from Oxford um, and universities as far flung as Rome, Beirut, Boston as well. It's a reappraisal of the scientific contributions of thinkers in the 12th and 13th centuries, not an oxymoron, um, uh, and it uses, it uses a serious collegiate um, a, a reading of these texts, both in the Latin, so scientists have some Latin to learn, and in English too, um, by the scientists, humanities scholars, we have paleographers who uh, in text, interpret the text themselves, um, translators, medieval philosophers, historians, and then science teams that have expertise in the topics today that inherit the subjects of the 13th century treaties. So for example, um, studying Robert Gross tests, wonderful uh, 1225 treatise De Luce on light, which contains a sort of big bang cosmology of the medieval cosmos. We have cosmologists who are working today um, helping humanities scholars to ask more uh, precise or different questions of the text. And this project has found new ways of reading those texts. It's also found new ways of triangulating the logic back to detecting scribal errors. Scribal errors that didn't arise from uh, grammatical errors, it didn't arise from spelling mistakes, they're hard to spot. Um, they, they make logical sense, but they disagree with the overall mathematical or scientific logic of the, uh, of the text as, as a whole. So uh, this um, has been a very exciting project and is exploring the deep ways as well in which the humanities and the sciences can support each other, how historically they've grown out of each other. The third example we chose comes from the medical humanities. Now that in itself is a new uh, field. It's being led in the, from the UK largely. Um, it's, uh, it's looking at how the humanities contribute to well-being, to health, and it's a project called Hearing the Voice, Wellcome Foundation funded. Um, Durham-based, uh, it uh, uses um, uh, teams from, encompasses teams from um, healthcare, medicine, uh, psychology, uh, medieval studies, history, English, modern languages and culture, classics, there's a very broad interdisciplinary mix, um, and a particular project called Hearing the Voice is exploring how the uh, 
uh, phenomenon of voice hearing, which is very much more prevalent than most of us, if asked, would say, uh, both in children and adults too, um, whether uh, approaches to voice hearing need really to be narrowed down to uh, identify it as a pathology, a schizophrenia, um, when in past centuries um, hearing voices were sometimes looked on very positively, voices of inspiration, artistic, theological, spiritual, um, um, and we wanted to research the ways that uh, different voice hearers managed their voice, this other, other person, looking historically at how others have done in the past, and to draw out from that good practice for the future, so that people who suffer voice hearing don't necessarily need to look at it in that way. It's a very exciting project. We wanted to include um, an interdisciplinary program that was in its early stages um, and uh, have, that have learned from some of the ups and downs of not only putting that sort of project together but acquiring funding for it as well over the long term. How would we like university leaders to read and respond to the paper? Well, of course, there are different types of leaders. There are, firstly, those academics who will be leading interdisciplinary teams. It's a hard job, and we say um, quite a lot about the leadership styles that we believe um, and have evidenced uh, best support it. In fact, a very participative approach is usually better in uh, a very mixed academic team than um, a strong uh, dictatorial leadership from the top. So participative leadership at one level. But we'd also like university leaders whose job it is to govern, structure, resource academic work to read it as well. We'll give them a number of models. It is, of course, possible to set up interdisciplinary research institutes and centres entirely outside departments or schools. The danger with that is that one's often removing well, a good chunk of, of staff from the school, sometimes are the best, most exciting ones. Um, we believe that there are ways in which both departments and these new centres can win if the structures are set up right, governed right, resourced right. Uh, so we'd like um, some uh, good practice to result from this, but we'd also like to suggest that uh, universities might try different ways of doing this. We don't think it's been solved completely yet. We think there are other models that it would be great to try. Institutes of Advanced Study, or IAS, Durham has one, and we spend a while talking about those. We see them as very important sort of nuclear generators of rather radical approaches to research uh, that um, that uh, start new programs going. The IS at Durham runs and has run for the last six or seven years now with annual theme programs, broad themes that any individual discipline can hook onto. The advantage is they might they can draw resource. What we do is we make fellowships available so any academic who resonates with the idea, for example, of light. Humanities, social sciences, sciences, think about it, was able to apply for funds to bring international and national fellows from within academia and without to Durham last year. The Institute of Advanced Study in Durham has its own building. It's a beautiful building. It's a Georgian house on Palace Green for those people who know, uh, who know Durham. Uh, medieval centre to, to the town. It's a lovely place. Um, and both academics from Durham University, the host university itself, and the visiting scholars spend three months together sparking off around the theme, um, working on individual disciplinary projects, perhaps as a foundation, but also building interdisciplinary teams that spontaneously arise. We look to the IS as a generator of tomorrow's research programs um, and uh, one that we've already mentioned, the Hearing the Voice program, sprung out of an IAS program a few years ago called Being Human, out of a chance encounter by uh, two or three people over tea at the IS one 
afternoon. Now, if one or two programs of that kind, radically inventive, um, addressing interesting issues, bringing disciplines together, and drawing in funding of several million, why not, um, emerge from an IAS uh, every year or so, then um, uh, the investment pays for itself quite quickly. There are, there's an international organization of university-based IASs now, UBIS, um, and there's a good practice that we comment on that, uh, it, um, again, allows the directors of those institutes to exchange what they do. There's no one way of, of running such an IAS. There are many models, and these models are being explored all the time as well. We aren't good, for example, at peer review of interdisciplinary research from research projects themselves when panel members will look at them very often through the, uh, the narrow spectacles of their own discipline, what's in it for me, of course an interdisciplinary project will look poor, will score small amounts on a scale that evaluates it by a filter uh, rather than by an integrator. Uh, we'd like, so peer review to get um, uh, around what a serious piece of integrated interdisciplinary research means. We'd also uh, like to look at another level, which is the national level. Every six years in the UK, uh, our research of every discipline at every university is evaluated through the Research Excellence Framework. And both the REF and its past incarnations haven't really served interdisciplinary research well. It demands that research is reported within narrow units of assessment drafted along the lines of disciplines. So research that is inherently interdisciplinary, in other words, it's hard to see the contribution that each discipline makes, and it's hard to see the output in the defined terms of each discipline makes it makes it has a hard time performing in ref even when those pieces of research um, have achieved radical outcomes that no single discipline could have done so one other thing we discuss um, is some hard-won advice for team members um, it's not just about leadership it's about followership as well on the other hand in an interdisciplinary team our, dis our discovery of experience is that everyone is a leader in some sense or another. So what responsibilities do we have? There are some handy rules of thumb that themselves are very salutary and very developing on a personal level. One of them is that in an interdisciplinary project there are no stupid questions. If we are afraid to open our mouths, we will never learn enough to engage with our disciplinary cousins effectively. The reason that there are no stupid questions is because this puts those of us who are often in teaching positions in a continually, in a very humble learning position with colleagues who are masters of their fields, fields of which, which we now need to know something but know nothing at all. So for example, the Ordered Universe Project, the example we, we take of medieval science being co-read co-worked on by scientists and humanities scholars. It's allowed, in fact it's encouraged for the humanities scholars to make scientific observations, suggestions, even to do experiments in the group. The scientists are allowed to suggest translations of the Latin and other readings. I think quite radical, but that's why the project works. If everyone stays in their silos. The uh, uh, integration and the emergent total being greater than the sum of the parts that we're all looking for in these projects never emerges.